other way. Two weeks ago, the confirmation class and I went down to Washington for their confirmation class trip. And one of those days was pure fun, spent seeing um, Washington, D.C. and the sites that are there. The next day, though, Sunday, was spent on mission work and also pilgrimage, looking at their spiritual life at the National Cathedral. But they started Sunday not in church. They started Sunday preparing lunch for 4,500 people. Think about that number for a moment. They knew, and I knew, we were going to a place, D.C. Central Kitchens, that prepares meals, 4,500, every single day. Day in, day out, they're preparing those kinds of meals. We all knew we were going to go do that, and we all thought it was a great thing to do. But have you ever actually thought about that number, 4,500? What that might translate to in terms of less. Just how many tomatoes does it take to feed 4,500 people? If you ask our kids, they can tell you how many onions need to be chopped to feed 4,500 people. They stood over kettles that were as big as this, stirring and stirring gravy for 4,500 people. They peeled and chopped potatoes for 4,500 people. At the end of the day, we looked at tray after tray after tray after tray, felt like it was stacked to the ceiling with salad for 4,500 people. It was something else. It really and truly was to be a part of just the, the sheer number of it. And it's an unusual organization. They have a group of 25 volunteers come in every single week. And we were part of that team, a team of 25. And they tell you right at the beginning of the day, your shift will end at 12. And as soon as it's done, you are free to go. We have more work to do, but you may go at 12. And at 12, it seemed like more than half, because it did, more than half of the team we were working with got up and left. Because the shift was over. And before I had a chance to talk to anybody about it, what I noticed is all the kids from St. Peter's were still chopping. They were still stirring. They were still peeling. They were getting done what needed to get done that day. And I finally went around and told everyone, we're going to stay until we get the salad made. And then we're going to go. We have other things to do. And even when I went around to tell them it was time to go, there was like this moment where I'm like, OK, let go of that paddle. Get your hand away from the gravy. We are going now. I mean, they, they were committed to getting their job done. This is the power of the cross. Think about the state that young people live in right now. What their primary focuses are. How they see the world. How they see their future. How they see our country. That conversation I had yesterday speaks to many, many people of that age group. <coughs> And here was a whole other group of kids that behaved in a way that spoke volumes about what they believed. The power of the cross changes that which is logical into something that can be miraculous, into something that can seem impossible. It is foolishness for us to pray for people who are sick with catastrophic illness. It is absolute foolishness. Talk to any doctor and they can tell you what the plan is medically. They cannot tell you what prayer is going to do. But with the power of the cross with us, week after week, we lay hands on people and we pray for healing. And guess what we see? Healing. And not just physical healing. Relationships healed. Lives that were broken healed. Situations at work that were healed. It is foolishness for people in having marital problems to stay in that marriage and continue working it out. 
to continue having the conversation when all seems hopeless. Because everything in American culture will tell you, get yourself to an attorney as quickly as possible. And still, we pray with people who have marital problems. We send them the counseling. We walk alongside them. And we claim their marriages by the power of the cross. Sometimes those marriages work. Sometimes they do not. I don't want to pretend like they always do because they don't. But what does happen when we bring the cross in there is the same healing that happens when people are sick happens to those folks whose marriage is in trouble. It is certainly foolishness for us to even be sitting here this morning. If you read the papers this week, I can guarantee you that there's an article somewhere written by someone who has the fantastic insight, new in their own mind, new that church is over, that Christianity is dead, that God is done. And we know by the power of the cross that every single time we gather together here as family that God is not only with us, but God is changing us. And that's the power of God. The power of what happened on that cross. It's not a one-time event. It is a daily event. For some of us, it's an hourly event. And depending on the crisis in our life, it may be a minute-by-minute minute event. This is our life, our lives as Christians. People who are continually transformed by Christ, continually transformed by the cross, continually transformed by the power of God. And so at the end of the day, we do exactly what Paul was talking about to that church at Corinthians. We boast on God. We boast on what God is doing here with us. We boast on what God is doing in our families, what God is doing in our work, what God is doing in our community. It is something that we can shout out to everybody that wants to hear it, that we can share to anyone who is lost and afraid and desperate. It is something that we need to say out loud to ourselves so we don't forget who we are and who we belong to. It is so tempting. It is so tempting to fall into the kind of lulling rhyme of that young man's story on the train. Everybody can do it. Everybody's got the same shot. Look at me, I started with nothing. It sounds good. It sounds really good. And through the eyes of Jesus from the cross, we know the story is faulty. And, and, God's got an even better story. Everyone is loved. Everyone is cared for. Everyone is taken care of by Christ in God's power through the cross. Amen.